This is Sam McAllister, and you're watching The Break It Down Show. I love it. This is fun. We, um, you and I both have booked some incredible people, you know, and then you see your work and you look across, like, and this is 100% true, just, um, just today on my little Facebook thing, it said, hey, don't forget, you interviewed Stuart Copeland from the police however many years ago. Oh, and you think, so oh, my God, we did that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I've That's taken what's so saying, cool about the job, isn't it? Just like the randomness of these experiences. It's amazing. Yeah, it, it is. It is. And so I've taken to saying I'm never uh, – surprised but i'm i'm quite often shocked when someone's like yeah i'll do that yeah it's just it's always a shock still you're kind of like waiting for a fight or for a no or for a reason why they can't do it or of course once they've said yes for a cancellation so it's just always isn't it like waiting for the rejection waiting for the cancellation waiting for the walk out there's always a problem so when it actually happens it's a mini miracle it is a little mini miracle right one of the things that people ask me when, I, when I'm booking people, and they're like, how do you get these incredible guests? And, and, you know, look, initially it was all just hard work and networking. And then and you must know, like, then you get approached, you know, hey, I want to come back. Or the PR person hits you up. or you know, and, and friends are like, I know someone, have them on the show. And so it, start, it starts to become that. But when you were first getting started and you were learning how to book guests, what, what was your formula? How did you figure it out? I mean, it's exactly as you've just said, Pete, that's a perfect description because at the beginning, you have nothing. No one knows your name. You have no connections. You have no contacts. And I came from a background in which I didn't have those kinds of contacts via my parents or friends or anything like that. So I literally started from zero. So in a sense, I suppose that was kind of helpful because I knew I had nothing and I had to get somewhere. So I, I actually made a list. I was very methodical about it. I made a list of kind of like publishers, agents, people I wanted to meet. And then I would try and see maybe like three or four a week. And all I had to offer, because it was the BBC, was a cup of coffee in my company, as good or bad as it was, and use charm. So yeah. I literally had to try and drag people to meetings. And that was the initial ambition. And then obviously it goes further and further and further. But I had nothing in my little black book. So I had to build it up from zero. Um, and along the way, obviously, a lot of rejections. You've got to have a thick skin, as you know, better than anybody. Yeah, you got to have thick skin. And, and the other thing is, is uh, I learned to not borrow. No, I'm like, well, you know, if I ask, I don't know, Johnny Depp and he doesn't respond and he ignores me. Well, he already doesn't pay attention to me. So really, the status quo has been maintained. But if and we've not had Johnny Depp on the show. But, but if we if Johnny does go, you know what? Yeah, and, and how many times, I want to add this in, have you sent someone a note saying, hey, I'd love to have you, you know, book you for the show? Have they gone, you know what? It's funny timing. I was just thinking about I need to get back out there. And you, by simply asking, you, you actually allow the opportunity for people to say yes to you. Well, I think you're absolutely right. It has to be a conversation, right? So as you said, sometimes they never ever get in touch. Now, if I don't hear, I try a multitude of ways. So if the email is a no, then we try the Twitter because sometimes they run their own Twitter, but they don't run the email. You know, their agent might have changed. So you try a new agent, you go on LinkedIn. I mean, you know what it's like. You try literally, I've even sent letters to people, old school. So you just basically try everything. And then you're right, there's a conversation that starts. And I like to deal with people when I don't want anything from them. Because at some stage in the future, it may be that they become news relevant or they have something they want to sell, like, for example, a book, and then they get back in touch. So often having the right person to speak to so that they can get in touch with you, maybe in a year, maybe never. But that is so important, I think, for creating the foundation of the possibility of a yes. But uh, um, I also think about the people that I would like to book. Who knows if we'll ever get them? I expect anybody who's willing to talk to the media, I can get now at this point. But um, you still got to catch them the right day. You still got to get to them in some way that makes sense. Sometimes, sometimes the booking agent is the wrong person to ask because they will not book. You know. <laughs> oh, God. But um, like, I'd love to get Kylie Minogue on the show. I just think that that she's. I just think the world of her and her talent and everything else. But I currently don't have a very good path to her. 
right? It would be a hundred percent in the dark shot and, and, you know, maybe get lucky. But I always have it in the back of my mind. Then there's probably a thousand people where I'm like, oh my gosh, a door just opened to Kyle Neiman Oak today because I'm talking to so and so. Well, you're absolutely right. I think that's the thing about it is you have like this constant Rolodex, right? Kind of in your head of the top five people, perhaps, that you're dying to get on. Kylie for you. You know, in my case, it would be, for example, Putin, you know, whoever it is. Let's say yeah. you're at a social occasion, right? And you're listening out like I do for every conversation, every little hint, a little clue towards your prize. And if someone says, oh, you know, actually last week I had dinner with Danny Minogue, then you'd be like in like Flynn. And if someone uh -huh. said to me, oh, I've got a friend who works at the Russian embassy, I'd be like, hey, you're my new best friend. And now I'd be listening out for Kylie for you. I'm not going to lie. So, you know, it's that, isn't it? We're like looking out for those little clues to our prize. It's like a treasure trail. And sometimes yeah. you never get there, but you might end up at a party and she just happens to be there. And you and I would go straight up to her, right? We just don't mind. So having that yeah. confidence is really important. I will say this. I've been at parties with like uh, Tom Hanks, you know, and, and uh, Tim Robbins where they're but I'm not going to approach them there because one of the things I have learned, and maybe you're going to teach me something right now, is um, if you're in the setting where they're there as Tom Hanks, they're obliged to say yes, but not obliged to actually follow up. So they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll say, what's a great way to get a hold of you? And they'll give me a phone number and then right back into not going to happen mode. Right. And so I always try to balance that. Like, do I pounce here? Or do I, you know, and I try to find another way because I usually don't like to knock on the front door because it tends to not work. I think I absolutely agree with you sometimes. I think it's a matter of instinct, though, isn't it? It's gut. So let's say you're at the party and Tom Hanks is there. He's looking like he's in one of those bad moods where he wants to shove a camera person out of the way. A hundred percent. Don't approach. But let's right. say you happen to bump into him, you know, over a canapé or whatever or a martini and he asks you what you do. And then you say, because he's introduced it, oh, I do this and, you know, I do interviews. And he's like, oh, right. And then you're, yeah, we'd love to have you. Casual like that, like it's not kind of over the top, I do think works. So it's all about context, I think. You're 100% right. You don't want to be a pain in the, in the butt. But equally, yeah. if opportunity knocks over a martini or, a, you know, a canapé or in the bathroom sometimes if you're a woman, you know, you're kind of like chatting <laughs> to someone, you know, and they work for Tom Hanks. I'm always going to go for it. I'll give it a shot. I don't mind a no. It's better than not having asked. Yeah, yeah, you're right. There's a balance there, right? You have to find it. In, and I guess like, when I say like when they're there working, like in this case, I'm not at a party with Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks is helping out a friend who's got a charity event. And so he's bringing the Tom Hanks aspect of his life. So he's in effect, he's working, you know? And so I'm like, uh, and so if I have that opportunity to have a conversation but you know that cue to get to him is so long, and then now you're going to bring that. You're just going to. I hate to ask for something in those cases. However, like you said, you catch him in that hidden moment when you both are having a beer in the back deck, trying to get some fresh air or whatever it is. You're right, there's a different time. Yeah, exactly. Like you know the bit when the party's kind of over or the event, and you're both outside. I mean, you and I must have both done it. I mean, I remember one time I was at an event and I was, you know, trying to get to Rupert Murdoch. And he just happened to leave the event just before me. He walked past me. I didn't get the interview, to be clear. But he was like walking past me and I kind of walked after him, you know, thinking maybe he'll go to a bar or something and I can just approach him. And, you know, if he says no, he says no. But I hadn't got anywhere near him. So it was better than nothing. But you're absolutely right. You might just bump into someone and then, you know, I'm going to take a shot. I can't help it. It's irresistible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I uh, So... You probably don't know this, but um, I used to be a spy in the army. And a lot of what we do is the same kind of work I did when I'd be overseas. Like I'd pick people to talk to and I would try to find. And I don't, I'm not looking for anything mechanical or anything, but I am looking for someone to talk to. And sometimes I got a bunch of guys with guns around me. So the person's going to talk to me, which is good and bad because now I have to have a different conversation. But that that whole thing of learning how to like read the room. And, and see like, hey, is this a day when I'm just building trust? Am I just going to go make sure? And I don't do these things to be phony, but like I'll go see the host. Like, hey, you've done a great job. If nobody else tells you today, I know you worked hard on this and you've been nervous about it. It's going great. And I'll tell them that because that also, one, we all want to hear that. But two, I want to be able to approach that person later on and be someone they're like, oh, I remember you. And just that little extra 
politeness. And I'm not saying phony. I'm saying genuine, you know, because it really is hard to throw a party, you know. Oh, it and, seriously and is. These things gain favor later on. And it also makes you just a kinder, better person. I completely agree with you. I think you've hit on two things there that are really important. If you were looking for like a booker or, a, you know, negotiator superpower, I do think that probably you and I share one thing, first of all, that people tell us all their darkest secrets. Lots yeah. of people said to me, I'd be a great kind of like double agent because yeah. I sit next to someone in a bar. Ten minutes later, they've told me about, you know, they're leaving their wife. Uh, it's women too sometimes, you know, telling me about how they did something in, you know, terrible when they were a child. I'm just one of those people. And then secondly, the thing that you've said where you kept saying, I don't do it to be fake. I have to say that too, because like you, I love to basically say something nice to people, show empathy, show kindness show decency. And often that's not got any agenda. It's just the nature of the beast. But sometimes later yeah. down the line, it does have an outcome. So it's a combination of nature, but also you're right. Sometimes strategically, it will have an outcome that's helpful to you. Yeah. When I write my little letter, I have a, a pretty standard format. I may change it up depending on the guest, but, but I do certain things. Um, you know, I, I don't say, oh my God, I'm your biggest fan. Because that puts you into a different category right away. I say, hey, you know, I'm the executive producer and host of the Break It Down show. I'd love to invite you to be on my show. And then I do bona fides so they know who I am and what I've done. And then I come back and I'm like, if you do me the honor of being my guest, then I explain like, what the ask is. I need an hour of your time. We'll be on video, that kind of thing. And then, again, I go to the bottom and then I'll say, it, unless I know something about them, like, hey, I know you're passionate about, like in my case, veterans. Um, you know, I'm a veteran. A lot of people listen to my show are veterans. So if that's at all motivational to you, know that this is a good place to do that. But I also will just say, hey, from all of us out here in humanity, thanks. Thanks for what you're doing. These books that you do, these things that you work on, the things that you stress out about, it's working and we appreciate it. And that just that little nugget, even if they don't say yes, and they mostly do. But that just I've crafted a letter that allows them to say yes. I haven't said, hey, I'm Pete. Be on my show. You know, <laughs> regards, Pete, you know, like it's it's more personal. And I do personalize each one. There are certain elements in all of them, but they're all personalized and from me, not just the format thing. I think that's really crucial because one of the things I would try and teach new producers is if it could be from anybody, then you've done a bad job. So, you know, the worst crime for me is getting the name wrong, cutting and pasting, mixing fonts misgendering people. I don't even mean in a politically correct way. I just yeah. mean, you know, generally calling Mr. When it's Mrs. You know, all of those basic things that say, I don't give a toot about you. I haven't bothered to learn about you. This is impersonal. And basically, I think I'm better than you. That's a terrible way to approach people. So just as you've described, I would absolutely personalize. In my game, in news, often what I would do is five minutes research, even that short, just looking at their Twitter feed, you know, news, Google search, the things they're passionate about. If I'm genuinely passionate about them or they're relevant to my program, I'd share my thoughts a little bit on that too. Because if it could be from anybody, then I've done a really bad approach. And clearly you take the same tactic and I think it's really useful. I, um, I'm also genuinely interested in the people that I say yes to. Sometimes it's, um, it's scary for me if the topic is dangerous. I'm like, well, then I have to do that. I have to put myself in this position so I can have this conversation. But also, like, I'm genuinely interested to talk to another version of me. I mean, you've done it on a totally different stage, totally different level than mine. But but I want to vibe with you and, and, and see what we can create and see what the conversation is. And and that even though we're on this little box, it comes through that I'm genuinely interested. I've, I thought, like, should I prepare or should I be more, like, fluid? I thought, no, I'm going to be fluid because you're not going to have any problem talking. But, I mean... There's work, there's passion, there's there's energy. My favorite is to sit across from someone and do it, but in this case, I was can't, you know? Well, you know, we could have met in the middle. Where's in the middle? I don't know. <laughs> but I completely agree with you. That, for me, is the magic of these conversations. It's also the magic of being able to listen. I think one of the things we've really lost in journalism, particularly with interviews and Q&As, is people who want to just you know, listen to the sound of their own voice, score intellectual points. They're waiting for you to finish so they can jump in and say something else about themselves. And sometimes you feel like it's two forces that aren't even combined. 
And so I love conversations like this, where clearly I'm really fascinated to hear about you. You're fascinated to hear about me. And it's something that only this collaboration could create. And that's, I think that's the wonder of these kinds of conversations. You book a lot of people. Do you get to actually interview them a lot of the time too? Or is that left to somebody else? And because BBC, like they're gonna have you do certain jobs specifically, I'm assuming. Yeah. yeah, the BBC is kind of like very sort of hierarchical. And I mean, I don't work there anymore, but when I was there, you effectively were the person, if you like, who gave birth to the child, and then the child was interviewed by somebody else. Yeah. So yeah. the presenter in my show latterly was a woman called Emily Maitlis. And so it was my job to bring her those nuggets, those pieces of gold for her to enjoy either in person or remotely celebrities, heads of state, yeah. members of the royal family. So I would have to give them up at some stage. My little baby had to be passed to the presenter and then you have to watch them make them soar or not quite as much. And that's really hard when you have to pass it over for sure. Yeah, I get the fortune of being able to have the conversation or give the conversation to my you know my co-founder who I'm like hey this is a perfect show for you but then i'm, I'm handing them something a, a gift i also another thing that i'm able to do with my show is i can bring in a co i, I could bring you back as a co-host hey sam co-host this episode with me and then you get that three-way dynamic and i gotta tell you it it makes for some magic conversations especially if those two people i want to create healthy tension so I don't mind if people disagree, but but I'm not a, a shouting point counterpoint kind of show. Like, let's uh, seek to understand if that makes sense. Yeah, I love the it used to be the conversations that we would disagree with one another, but without disrespect. And I think, unfortunately, things have become so polarized. You know, it's chicken and egg. People enjoy the television moment where people are angry with one another and competing. And then separately, in a beautiful hypocrisy, they complain about how, you know, news has diminished kind of like in terms of quality. So we all feed into that same kind of like behavior. And I think absolutely the same as you. People are interested in conversations that may have difference, but without anger and disrespect, because otherwise you learn nothing. It's just two people shouting and that doesn't teach us anything. Here in America, we had a guy named Mike Wallace. He worked for 60 Minutes, you may be. And he would pounce and he would ask hard questions and direct and that kind of thing. And uh, I always felt like his approach, look, he was fantastically successful. So far, far be it for me to be too critical of him. But his approach wouldn't work for me because I want to hear from the person. I want to hear what they have to say. I don't have to agree with it. In a lot of ways, I'm playing a role where I'm, I'm part me, I'm part the audience, and I'm also trying to help this person express who they are. So I'm, I'm playing a bit of an advocate for them to really get them to open up. And it's not as, you know, doing interviews is not as straightforward as asking all the questions I want. I have to ask the right questions. Well, I think that's really what's interesting about it because the process that I was involved in would often involve that briefing conversation where I could do exactly what you've described, either speaking to the person directly or their representative. And we'd have those three wonderful things, a little bit of aggro, a little bit of tension, you know, a little bit of kind of humor, and a little bit of warmth and something in the middle between the two. Now, the issue with a program like mine at Newsnight, but it is quite a combative situation. Right. It's holding people to account. It's to be pretentious for a moment, kind of dealing with the democratic deficit when it comes to dealing with, you know, politicians, for example. But the hilarious thing would be when one of the presenters would treat someone who's a bit less political, who doesn't really deserve that treatment, as if they know yeah. they've committed some kind of war crime. So I remember a particular time with the British astronaut, Tim Peake, who's a charming, brilliant guy. And my presenter at the time, who won the best presenter ever, called Jeremy Paxman, he's kind of a legend here. He kind of treated him like he just kind of like killed his dog or something, you know. <laughs> so sometimes I feel the line gets crossed the wrong way. So it must be nice to be able to do it, that you don't have to treat everybody as if they've committed some kind of war crime. Yeah, and you've got a certain job to do on a show that can be contentious, but you also don't need the presenter making your job harder for you. So do you ever have to have that conversation of, hey, buddy, like, I know you're doing your job, but could you lighten up on the people that are, you know, slice of life people instead of hammering the astronaut or, you know, Kylie Minogue? Did you have to be that crappy to her? Because now I got to go, I got to go book somebody else and the word's going to get out. 
<laughs> well, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's a merry dance because our program was kind of like re renowned for being quite sort of, you know, aggressive. So I would spend a lot of time convincing people, uh, not Tim Peake, obviously, but say it was Kylie Minogue, for example, or Amy Schumer or, you know, Trevor Noah, whoever it was that we had on, that they wouldn't be torn from limb from limb. Because why would they want to come on when they're obviously very wealthy and they've got a great empire and be treated with disrespect? But the difference perhaps between our countries is that there would often be an element of surprise about what our version of non-aggressive is, which probably uh -huh. is still substantially more aggressive than your idea of non-aggressive, because we don't do interviews that don't have some moment of tension or criticism. And that for many American guests could be a bit of a shock. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. 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 yeah and I, I guess if you're going to be on a show like that, you need to do your homework and watch a little bit of it to kind of get a vibe for, for what's happening. Right. I mean, if you have time, if you're maybe if you're famous and your, your time is money, maybe you don't watch ahead. But yeah, that's crazy. That's crazy yeah. to deal with. You could be a lamb to the slaughter if you don't do that. And I was always fascinated, given how wealthy some of these individuals are and the people they have around them, because they have so few people who speak truth to power, right? So let's take, for example, the ex-Google CEO, Eric Schmidt. He was a classic example. He came on the program. He wanted to do it with a co-author. And the three questions of great interest to us here in the UK would be tax, tax. And the third question, you got it, tax. And he, <laughs> seemed, he seemed surprised to be asked about it. Now, in a British forum, every time if you came on, the three things that you hate to be asked about are the three things you're going to get. But clearly, he'd done a lot of interviews where he had been able to define his terms of what he spoke about. And he seemed a little bit annoyed, uh, let's putting it mildly, that he couldn't do that with us. It was a surprise. So the people around, I think, sometimes uh, let down their protagonists by not having done the proper research on exactly what the interview is going to be like. We've got Sam McAllister on the show today. Look down below. There's the link or look in the uh, show comments. It should be in there. Get her book scoops on Amazon. And you know what I always say to everybody get two and read with a friend because that would help out <laughs> Sam. You see what a great person she is and how fun she is. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's all back up Sam and get her book and, and learn about this. You, um, you booked Sean Spicer. I had the opportunity to book Sean Spicer and I just wasn't interested. Because I didn't know what I was going to do with Sean that um, would be different because he's a very political guest at the time when I was offered him. And I just thought, you know, I just I'm just not interested. Right. As interesting and as, as click worthy as he is, he's doing a tour. And, and, and a lot of times like they're just on their talking points. And I just I couldn't be bothered with him. Um, when you're trying to pick someone, are you working off of a list or. How do you like say yes to the right people and no to the people that you're not interested in? Well, you know, there's how our lives diverge, right? You were offered him and declined him. I had to work my little bones off to get him onto the program uh, because <laughs> <laughs> the difference is, right, that you have like a, you know, you're in an international setting, you're setting a right. U.S. objective. And you're absolutely right. He did a lot of U.S. interviews, but I think he did one international interview. So the bun fight for the one international interview, as you can imagine, is pretty cutthroat. Now, in Sean's case, the reason I thought he was really interesting was because we got nowhere in terms of the protagonists in the Trump administration. We didn't get anybody who was like the highest profile. The BBC got McMaster. I think that was the kind of like the highest profile person for a global network, you can imagine. You know, not to have a Trump interview, for example, never happened. So Sean was an access point for us, having never had any of those interviews, to a world that our audience were absolutely fascinated by. And I don't know if you've had a chance to read that chapter, but that turned out to be an absolute corker because he wasn't expecting the way that he was spoken to. And our presenter gave him a lot of welly, as we call it here or grief, as you may call it over there. And it was like yeah. the front page of like TMZ. It was every paper in the world. So it could have been a damp squib. Actually, I thought he just might take his mic off and walk off. I don't think he would ever have done this again. But it turned out to be his one probably extremely challenging interview. And it was a great, great outcome for us. But it could have gone the other way. You're absolutely right.
Yeah, and and I had to think long and hard about you know Sean Spicer. Um, it also because I'm in America, like okay, let's say that I, I decided to reach out to Donald Trump. I, I didn't because again, I'm not really sure what I would do with him. It would be easy just talking, but but he is such a non-compliant guest. And, and he's such a problem, right? Like, once I have him on my show, because of what my show is, and I'm just, you know, I'm just a dude running my show, um, it can be very divisive, and I try not to be. And I wasn't sure how I would get through that. So, so I, I, didn't, I didn't even approach Donald Trump, because if, if they said yes, I'd be like, well, now I really got to figure this out, you know? And I don't, <laughs> I don't know that Donald Trump would be good for my show. I did, however, have a, a representative from Monsanto come on the show. And... I wanted to do that because these corporations, you know, like, if, like BP or whoever it's going to be, they're really bad at talking openly to the That's public. Right. And, they, and they do a lot of good things. I'm not saying they're all good, but there, there's, a, there's a balance there, right? And so we, we uh, took a lot of pre-conversations. And, and one of the things we said is we're not going to ask you questions you can't answer because you've got pending lawsuits. We get it. Let's not spend time there. Let's spend time understanding what you guys do. And let's talk about some of the science aspects of it. And it was a fantastic interview because one thing I didn't want to do, and I had a really clear image of this in my mind, and I was surprised when they say yes, I was stoked to do the interview, was to be told that something is evil on the news and like over and over and over again, because now you're selling me something, right? And I'm like, no, let's talk to these guys. Let's understand who they are. I think that's a really good piece of advice, actually, because it's one of the huge things, right? about these kinds of interviews that people have made a moral judgment beforehand about goody or baddie. Now, they may get through an interview like that and they may come to the same conclusion, but if we don't have those conversations with the complexity, the layers of information that you've just described, then we're never gonna get to a conclusion that is anything other than quite simplistic and binary. So I love to give people information and they can come to their own conclusions about whether they're good or bad, hopefully with a bit more information than they had prior to the interview. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, um, I've been sort of saving it, but I, I guess I want to get into it now. The um, booking Prince Andrew, wow. And, and when you book someone, I guess this is where I want to start. When you book someone, especially someone like that, you're like, is this really booked? When did you know? And how much doubt was there along the way on, uh, they're saying they're going to show up, but be ready for nothing to happen at 8 p.m. <laughs> I think, you know, you're absolutely right. Part of this is that you never, ever believe the interview is happening until the camera is rolling, right? And even right. then, you might yeah. get to the end and then you're waiting for a lawsuit or, you know, or some terrible thing to happen. I think the moment that he sat down in the royal chair, which is the front cover of my book, The Empty Chair, before the royal bottom arrived, when he yeah. sat down in that chair, he was mic'd up, and the very noisy room that I was in with all the detritus of television, you know what it's like, all the layers of cables, all the people, all the staff, when it went hush, uh -huh. that moment of silence, Yes. And then the first question came from my presenter. In that second, I'm like, geez, this is actually happening. Whether we're going to get it to air, that's a second question. But it's actually, <laughs> this is yeah. real. I'm not tripping. You know, this is not a dream. He's yeah. actually going to speak to us on camera. Oh, my days. Yeah. It's, um, it, it's remarkable and, and fast. I, I just can't imagine how tickled you were to do that. Do you, are you at all involved with the presenter to say, here are some of the things that we discussed or I mean, how, when does the, when does the full transfer hand over to the, let the professional on that end do their job and, and you've done your, when does your role stop? Well, this was a really unusual circumstance because usually in my career, what would happen is I would do the negotiation, usually with the second in command or sometimes the first in command. But often, as you know, you're dealing with kind of like somebody who is the gatekeeper. And then I would do all of that negotiation on my own. And then when I got it over the line, as we say, and it had been set in a time and place, then the presenter comes and does the actual interview. Now, this was very unusual in my career because... Earlier on in the negotiation, I'd made the decision to take the presenter with me. So the second time I went to Buckingham Palace, I took Emily with me. And I'd never done a negotiation with a presenter in the room with me. And it was really, you know, an unusual experience. And the last negotiation, 
face to face with Prince Andrew himself in Buckingham Palace. I mean, how many levels of surreal can you get? Had Emily, myself, and the now editor of the program, a guy called Stuart McLean, and I'd never ever done a negotiation with a deputy editor or an editor present, I can tell you that for nothing. So it was a completely different experience from any other time in my career. So, you know, the handover, if you like, was less kind of harsh than it normally would be because we'd had some moments together with him alone prior to the interview itself, which was highly unusual. Do you get starstruck or have you like, I tend to not get starstruck, but I do have to calm myself down because sometimes like I'm in charge of so much stuff when I show up. Right. And I'm just trying not to get drenched in sweat from again, not nerves, but like, I've got to move this. I've got to do that. Am I late? I'm on time, but you know, this has got to get plugged in. And so I'm trying to maintain a level of calm, but then you realize you look around you're like, I'm in Buckingham palace or I'm in Stuart. I'm on Stuart Copeland's couch and he's eating the pineapple that I brought, you know, and it can, <laughs> it can make these surreal moments that can, you know, that can take you out of that of the moment. So when you, I mean, can you be starstruck by, by Buckingham palace? I mean, that's an incredible place to be in general. Oh, absolutely. I always say I was like an experienced billionaire. I mean, the <laughs> kinds of places you get to go, the people you get to meet it's without being like mawkish. It's an absolute privilege, right? Who gets to sit 15 yeah. feet behind a member of the Royal family in Buckingham palace recording a conversation like that? I mean, literally like five people in the world ever. So I find that really exciting. And I find it kind of like really, you know, overwhelming sometimes because of the pressures that you're describing and making sure it gets to air. But in terms of starstruck, that's just not a thing for me, except one time. So everybody ha. else, right, everybody else would be like, oh, my God, it's Emma Thompson. You know, I want a selfie. Never, ever, ever, except one time. And it was actually someone American. It was that I think he's a five-time gold medalist, unless he lost one. Michael Johnson, one of your greatest oh, yeah. ever athletes. I'm a massive track and field fan. He was in the yeah. green room. I had the book. I never did it ever again or with anyone else. I didn't get a photo, but I did ask him to sign the book. So the one time I was starstruck was by the brilliance of like human achievement, not by the brilliance of being a celebrity, which I'm afraid doesn't do anything for me. Yeah. Well, I mean, burning down at 200 meters as fast as he did, you know, is like just... a chicken, like a chicken. <laughs> oh, fast. Yeah. And that, that crazy stance that he had. And uh, only now are people approaching the speed and his record doesn't stand anymore, but only now are people reliably getting anywhere near him. I mean, he was just like a generation ahead of himself in terms of his, uh, his success. So I can appreciate that. Yeah. Not besmirched yeah, yeah. by any drugs uh, along the way, although he did lose a gold medal because of somebody else who was in your relay team, but yeah, a true legend yeah. in terms of human achievement. So he was the one that I was uh, starstruck by, but strangely not starstruck, by Prince Andrew, because obviously a slightly different kettle of fish in terms of what we were putting to him, and I'd met him already. So perhaps if I hadn't met him in the negotiation, it would have been completely overwhelming. But what was overwhelming was the thought of getting this on air. Imagine when those answers start coming in. You're sitting there thinking, if this was Russia, I'd be six feet under, right? Oh. How, how do you get that on air? What a country, you know, yeah. that nothing has happened to me as a result of effectively our team bringing down a member of the royal family. And that's a credit to the kind of advanced democracy I live in, but it does really, really put the pressure on you and the stress in terms of knowing how impactful the thing you're going to deliver is going to be. And I guess the other thing we'd have to cover, right, because these things are always complex and layered, is like what kind of a country, in this case, do you live in, but for us here especially, we do this, where a guy can do what Andrew did and he's not in jail. <laughs> it's like all these things that happen. You know, we have people right now looking at the last president's uh, classification protection. You know, um, we have these things all the time where we have this amazing thing where we have this uh, one Congress member. And um, first off, female, black, Islamic, a refugee, contentious. Yeah, probably. Yeah, exactly. Probably an anti-Semite, you know, likely. <laughs> And in, in our amazing country, she can sit there and get reelected. And I think that's fantastic in terms of what our country is. But then you look at other aspects and you're like, oh, it's so embarrassing that, that we have these 
And this, this is not an endorsement of Elon Omar. It's it's you look at all the things that say that she shouldn't get elected and she's been elected twice and probably will get elected the next time. And so you have these things where you have Prince Andrew does this odious, allegedly does this odious thing that should be we should all have contempt for. Um, but you also can say it out loud on the news. Well, that's what's amazing. It's funny. We actually did interview Ilhan Omar, though not, I didn't arrange it. So that's why I knew your reference. Um, I think with Prince Andrew, this is where, to be pretentious for a moment, right? This is yeah. where journalism truly matters. The accountability element. You're absolutely right. It doesn't look like there will be a physical day in court for Prince Andrew. And that is obviously lamentable for a number of people who have fiercely pursued litigation against him. But he did have his day in the court of public opinion globally. And yeah. we see the effect that's had. So in some small way, the work that I was part of brought an accountability that only journalism can offer. And I used to be a criminal litigator, so I did criminal defense. It's entirely different in terms of the word justice, but it did deliver a kind of justice somewhere yeah. between what people would want and a lot bigger than nothing. So you're absolutely right. I think it's you know kind of a, an interesting and complex conversation. But you were saying you wouldn't interview President Trump. Uh, would you interview President Biden right now? Would he be on your list? No. I don't think he has a mental capacity to do it. And, and I don't want to be shucked and jived. And mm -hmm. so uh, I don't think I would touch him. I would touch a later president who's been done with it for a while. But I, I don't want to. Um, on this show, I, I wouldn't be interested in Joe Biden, what he has to say. I, I frankly have no respect for the man. because He's been a bumbling idiot for decades. And um, I don't care about the politics. I care about the capacity of the man. And so I don't think that um, I just don't want to be lied to right to my face. I, so I can I, yeah, that's really please. interesting because it's so interesting for you because you're lucky, I think, that you're able to make a decision based on interest. So, oh, my God, I'm so flattered. You know, you wouldn't do President Biden, but you did, you know, this nobody Sam McAllister. <laughs> but the thing that's uh, fascinating about that is that in news that that decision is taken away from me. You know, yeah. if it's Joe Biden, if it's VP Harris, we got to have them on, even if it's the most boring 10 minutes in human history, by nature of the status of their office, we got to try and have them on. And that is obviously frustrating that you can sometimes spend two years getting someone who is more boring than watching paint dry, terrible yeah. television, you're tearing okay. out your hair, but you just had to do it because they've got, you know, the name, the status, and that's what news has to deliver, unfortunately. Or fortunately, depending on how you look at it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you know, and you want clicks and you want things that are sensational and everything. But yeah, I mean, I, I do have the luxury of doing what I want to do and what I find interesting and what I find dangerous. But I just don't, I, yeah, maybe the next president I'll be interested in. I don't know. It's hard to say. Um, and, you know, who? I'm probably wrong. I probably should be trying to interview Donald Trump and Joe Biden. You know, I probably <laughs> In a three-way? Like, I'm available to be the fourth person, no problem. <laughs> I, I will say this. is the um, One of the things I do want to do is I want to shake up. In America, a lot of our media, and I'm just going to say honestly, is bullshit, right? There's a whole bunch of the same thing where we want clicks. We do things that trend well on Twitter because that's how they get their attention. That's how they sell ads. And that's how they ultimately, you know, ads sell cars right and that's what it all comes down to i mean when 60 minutes used to be this widely respected program and and as we've seen over the years like they'll kill a story that needs to be told because it's bad for advertising and so so like i don't know where i'm going with this now anyhow i get disappointed when these kind of things happen and i don't want to fall into the same trap so if i'm going to book somebody it's because I'm genuinely interested in, in what they're doing and how they do it. Or maybe I'm doing them a favor because they're an emerging act or, you know, whatever it is, right? It, maybe it's a friend or someone who I find fascinating for some reason that nobody else would care about. And I, I get to do that on my show. I mean, that's amazing because obviously you've talked about something there that became really the bane of the journalist's life, which is, you know, news for clicks. Now, I would try to keep myself distinct from that. My decision would be based on the old school perspective of, okay, let's yeah. imagine my viewer, the BBC viewer in the UK or in the US or in Kenya or wherever he or she is. And is there something here that basically informs them? Do I give them information they wouldn't have had? Do I create yeah. something interesting, a moment of learning or a revelation? Yeah. 
And that's kind of my test. But when Twitter and, you know, all these other things came along, the question of, well, you know, how's that going to perform for clicks? Oh, that's such a hard new paradigm because uh, often those things conflict hugely. Yeah. And so you had to balance the need for your initial credibility with absolutely the need to create, you know, clicks and attention. And often those clash and that could be quite a sophisticated decision making process. Yeah, it's uh, YouTube is sort of my uh, editor, right? And so you're supposed to, I'm supposed to, when we're done with this show, I'm supposed to make a picture and I'm not exaggerating. It's like me going like this. <laughs> I can't believe what I've heard, you know? And then I have to. Have to do it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> They're both so excited, you know? We do it at the same time. One, two, three, go. <laughs> And then the headline has nothing to do with the story. It'll be like, you know, Prince Andrew, child porn, whatever thing, you know, and without that, that would be, and it would get pushed to the front, you know? So this isn't just like, can I attract eyeballs? Can I be allowed to attract eyeballs? And so am I willing to sacrifice my own personal integrity by using that ridiculous picture, which I may do in this case, because I think it's hilarious, <laughs> but, um, and then write up a headline that's deceiving, you know, and, but, or am I just going to do what I think is quality work and put that forward and let, and let that work defend well, itself, I, even though I know the algorithm is going to depress it. Well, I would have a rule about that. And my rule was basically this, that I would allow myself one in three. So obviously uh -huh. like, you know, we would often ask the guests a sort of a silly question, a silly season question or a contentious question. Take, for example, Justin Trudeau, the Canadian prime minister, who I insisted my presenter asked about the way he looked because everyone was talking about, you know, how pretty he was and whether or not that had an effect on his kind of like version of being elected. My presenter didn't want to ask, but I knew that's what members of the general public were thinking. So the first tweet is serious about Canadian economic policy. The second tweet is semi-serious about, you know, the future of kind of like our countries. And the third tweet it's the hair. Now, you and I both know which one got the interest, but at least I had the plausible deniability of, you know, the two serious ones beforehand, yeah. because that is, um, it is the nature of the beast. You know, everyone wanted to talk about his hair and his boxing. That was what the man had brought into the public domain. It's true, right? Like these things, I, when I, I booked Alex Vindeman, who testified against Donald Trump in the first and Alex was a army colonel at the time, right? And his brother is a twin, and they're both from Ukraine, and now they're Americans, all these other things, right? And so uh, I knew what I wanted to ask, and it had nothing to do with what everybody else had already asked him, right? Because it was very politically charged with him. And, and um, there's certain rules in the Army, and I can ask these questions because I'm an Army guy. And so one of the things I wanted to ask him was, is, look, you're a colonel. You're working for the boss. The boss directs what you do. You but I'm going to go counter to that and testify against this guy. There's no way in hell you believe that you would keep your job after you did that. And you probably went and checked on your career to see, were you able to actually do this? And, and sure enough, he's like, yeah, you know, you're right. I went and talked to my brother. I thought long and hard about it. The other thing he had said a lot was, um, I, I've been, I've been victimized. I've been fired. And now I'm, I'm out on the street. And I'm like, that's bullshit, Alex, because you get to retire as a colonel, which is not a bad retirement. You knew you would lose your job going in because you cannot. No president is going to allow some colonel to testify against them and be like, oh, well, you keep your job. Like, that's never going to happen. You can keep no your job way the fuck over there, right? You know? And so <laughs> I'm asking these questions because there was a lot of bullshit in that. Like, you don't get to play this victim when, look, should we look up? what your retirement is and then we can talk about how much of a victim of you are and by the way you instantly got offered a job by somebody else you're always going to be able to make six figures just for the fact that you stood up so this was actually an investment in your future but being able to ask that question you have to have that insider knowledge of what it means to be a, a colonel in, in the american army and then testify against the president like this is a pretty safe decision and if it goes with his and, and i believe it does his political ideology then then let's not play the victim. Just say, hey, I saw something that was wrong. I wanted to stand up. Consequences be damned. And let's be honest, I'm fine. But I needed to do this. So I wanted to, I wanted to put him on the spot on that because you don't get to claim victim when you're not, you're not a victim at all. 
Well, absolutely. And I think, you know, that's the thing, isn't it, about having diverse people interviewing people because we bring our own experiences and our own yeah. knowledge. So, you know, having come from different backgrounds or done different professions, it's hugely important and influential in the kinds of questions you will or won't ask. And, you know, as you've said, you know, we know where that goes with him. That goes to book deal. That goes to talk uh -huh. show host. Right. That goes to a tour, maybe some stage thing. It goes to front pages yeah. of all the papers of him looking kind of like heroic. You know, he turns from <laughs> zero to hero in his own head. So what you were doing was testing that paradigm. But most people wouldn't be able to do that. And that's why you get a lot of interviews that sound the same, because nobody bothers to do the research or they don't have the personal knowledge through no fault of their own. So I love those moments where somebody brings their own personal experience for accountability. That's electric. Yeah. Who did you get, but didn't quite get on the air that you're like, damn it. It was so close. We almost had. X. Okay. This is going to be a moment like where my face goes a little bit ashen, more ashen than it is already. Cause I'm sure you've had those ones. So my particular one that I've never got over and I am, I don't bear grudges ever, except this one, right? This one grudge. I had the option of speaking to Dennis Rodman. Uh -huh. The first interview when he just left North Korea oh, wow. with access to pictures of him with the great leader doing things like smoking cigars and sitting around like playing ball and in a hot tub. So pictures the world had never seen. And get this. It was going to be live from Vatican City because he was having a visit with the Pope as well. I mean, you cannot make that up. You cannot make that up. I mean, that is just like game over. Get me to air. Give me 20 minutes. Let's watch this burn, baby. Yeah. But my editor turned it down and I've oh. never recovered. Ten years in, I'm still like, what was she thinking? So yeah. that would be the one that I rue to this day that I uh, still can't speak about without getting a little bit flushed about it, as you can see. How hard do you get the push? I think it depends how experienced you are. So at that stage, I pushed with anger, which was not a good response. I tried logic, it failed, and I just was angry. I had to leave the room. Later in my career, when I had more credit in that piggy bank of credibility, we had, for example, an interview with Prince Albert of Monaco. It was a no-brainer, and my program, for various dull reasons, wouldn't run it. Well, on that occasion, I took it to someone else in the BBC, it was like the most watched thing. Sorry to be smug momentarily, but, you know, kind of like for, for 48 hours. And it was one of the biggest widely covered interviews that the BBC had all year because I had confidence in my capabilities and I had confidence in them being angry at me, basically, for going against them. But it has to be the right thing because often you're a minion, right? And you can't afford to spend your time peeing off your bosses. But on that occasion with Dennis Rodman, if I could build a time machine and go back. Yeah. I would make that happen somehow because that was an absolute no brainer and it was criminal that we turned it down. I tell you. Yeah. Yeah. Dennis Rodman is, is an instant clicker anyhow, because he's just so clickable. I mean, I've still got the pictures, you know, the world never saw those pictures of him and the great leader, you know, King Jong-un. I mean, like he doesn't get out much, the guy. So the pictures were quite something. Yeah. Well, I'm going to work on Dennis Rodman. We're going to get him on the show. You and I are going to have him on right here. That's what we're going to <laughs> All right, roll raise the roof. Um, look, you wrote this book, and what are you doing now? And then does the book feed into that? Yeah, I mean, basically, the truth of it is, is that I wanted to tell my part of this very important story because it profoundly changed, you know, journalism and the royal family and the way that the BBC works. I, I say it with no criticism, but just factually is they're not really used to producers kind of writing books. They're used to presenters doing that kind of thing. Right. So it became apparent that if I wanted to tell my part of this tale, that I needed to leave. Uh, so that was basically the decision I took. Yeah. And I thought I'd throw the dice. I had a little settlement for leaving, voluntary redundancy that took me a while to get. And I thought, you know what? I'm just going to throw the dice on myself and give it a year or two and see where it goes. And... I do events, I do speaking, I host things, corporates, that kind of stuff. And then my book's been optioned. So, so far, so good. It looks like we're going to have a film and there may well end up being a second book. So the risk is looking like it was a good cost benefit analysis so far, but you yeah. never know. You, you never, never know. know. You never know. It's created opportunity. You can't deny that. 
I mean, we wouldn't be talking otherwise. You know, that's the joy of this. I've had to be in a little box. As you can tell, my personality is not very little boxy. Yeah. So it's been a real joy to be able to just, you know, have these kinds of conversations that I used to have silently on the phone you know at my desk and were never broadcast and yeah. now I do broadcasting or do podcasts you know I appear on UK television so yeah. it's really been you know I'm very very blessed the um it, it's really an incredible time too because you can take this this leap one of the things that I'm trying to sort out in my head and you know I only have so much bandwidth right so I've really got to sort it all the way out I would love to have instead of these hocus pocusy bs media major media market driven political uh, conversations. I'd like to do like a very Rogan-esque thing where I sit down with the person, like, what is your platform? How do you intend to provision this? How do you intend to, to build a consensus? And instead of these talking pointed fake things, like you don't get to, you don't get to pick what hits you in life. So you don't get to pick what happens on the show. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be out there to get you, but you better have thought this through if you want to be in charge of a million people's well being. 300 million or whatever it's going to be there's a place for that now where we don't have to just see this corporatized nonsensical thing you can slow down and say hang on a second you know because it's not just seven minutes and then break for commercial and goodbye right we, we can really do a better form of journalism these days and so i think you picked a great time to punch out and you have the world at your feet of what you want to do and what you I love that. Thank you. You've really inspired me there. But I think we're, what's interesting here is we're coming from quite different experiences, right? Because in the UK, much of our journalism is the opposite of deferential. It's a complete pain. It's the kind of thing where the politician comes off and you know, sort of shakes their, shakes their fist at the interviewer, but then they go for a drink. Because the game here is you oh. get on, you get given aggro, you get asked all the hard questions, but everyone understands that's how it works. Now, that deference, unfortunately, is starting to creep in. And that may well be from the fact that you can get away with that in a lot of markets now where you set conditions, which we don't allow, where you ask for questions, which we don't allow. So why would you put yourself in that position of jeopardy, which is effectively what you're doing on that kind of cost benefit analysis? Well, I say because it's fun and because you're not some kind of weak loser you know, yeah. you're running a country, you're yeah. running a multi-billion pound company, a billion right. dollar company, you know, 10 minutes with a journalist. I mean, come on, that's got to be a piece of cake. And if it isn't, then you shouldn't be doing that job, frankly. So <laughs> sometimes sometimes you can provoke someone, you know, into, into taking part. But you can also see, I'm sure we both agree why this safe, boring, easy option is less uh -huh. risky for shareholders, for voters. You know, you can see why they go for that option and probably their advisors who are risk adverse and want to keep their jobs, yeah. give them the advice to do that. So it's trickier, harder and harder to get these accountability interviews with jeopardy, excitement and accountability all the way. Yeah. Yeah. One of the questions I love to ask members from Congress, is, um, what are you going to do to, to be bipartisan? Like how, how much can you tolerate with that? Who are you going to work with to write legislation? Boy, they hate that question. You know, they come up with an answer. Um, or like the folks that are very uh, into diversity, and I'm like, diversity and unity are antonyms. So how do you deal with that? And you get to ask, and that's not a gotcha question. It's a thoughtful question. You have, you want unity, but you also need diversity, and you have to, you got to balance it. And it's not as easy as you want it to be. Like, what do you think about these things? And I think it's a wonderful way to take someone who's trying to be in charge of something or is in charge of something and, and just test their metal to see like, what kind of person are you? You know, are you going to be dismissive of, in our case, over half of the nation because they're not in your party? Or are you going to be like, no, we got to work on this stuff together. And yeah, we're going to fight a little bit. That's what's great about our country. We don't got to get along, you know? And so you, you give them the opportunity to really shine when you ask those kind of questions, as opposed to the, you know, I, I want to ask thoughtful questions. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And I think also that what we've created in lots of our political systems is exactly what you've just described, where someone who may actually initially have been a great ideas person, quite yeah. sophisticated, maybe they dealt in gray areas, maybe they didn't see everything as one extreme or the other. Little by little, they're forced into those extremes, you know, Democrat, Republican, conservative, yeah. Labour, whatever it is in whichever country you're in. And it diminishes them. It does them no favor. And it diminishes the conversation in the nation because 
you know, if you're only going to hear shouty person versus shouty person disagreeing, although in yeah. private, they might have a lot more in common, but they can't risk that commonality uh -huh. because it causes them difficulty with their own political colleagues. That is damaging for all of us. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's some really hard questions in that vein uh, that I, I, I ask because they need to be asked. You know, like when you, I'll have someone on who's um, uh, concerned about the condition of black people in our country. And I'll say, what, what does the black community owe itself? Where is the work for, for them? And every community's got work, so it's not just the black people, but it's all people, you know, whatever, whatever section or faction or ethnicity they're from, what does your community owe itself? And it opens up these conversations like, Whoa, well, wow. Uh, and sometimes they say these words on my show live. I can't answer that. That's too dangerous. And you think about that, you're like, we're trying to solve these problems, and you can't even talk about what the problems are internally. In, in this case, we're using black folks in America as an example. But this goes to everybody. I mean, every oh, country has this problem, you know? 100%. I think there were some very difficult conversations in this country, similarly around vaccination take up, which oh, sure. was very much dependent upon social class and ethnicity and age mm -hmm. and all kinds of things that sound like terrible judgments. They sound like class judgments. They sound like racism. They could sound like Islamophobia. They uh -huh. could sound terrible and bigoted. But actually, if you don't have that conversation, you're not saving the lives of those people who you might be able to reach if you were able to have that conversation. So it's a very difficult balance between open and honest conversations and avoiding, obviously, you know, demonizing people from a particular group, which we all want to avoid. Uh, I'm just going to make this quick statement and then we're going to throw a question at you. But my buddy Matt Hoy used to sing um, in UB40 and oh. UB40 with Ali and, uh, and Astro. And uh, he had to leave the band because he couldn't get vaccinated. And so right now there's actually a lawsuit and everything going on about this because it turns out you can't compel someone to get a vaccination against his doctor's orders, you know, without a fight. And so you have these conversations where it's like, wait, we compelled people against their doctor's advice to, be, you know, and these are not simple problems to solve. It's not my job to understand who's right or who's wrong, but it is my job to listen to what Matt has to say and give him a platform and hear, and hear from him as, as, uh, as he tries to sort this thing out. You know, we're all doing our best in these things, but gosh, COVID was such a, such a crazy thing to deal with. Well, I think people like to surround themselves with the comfort of people who agree with them. I, I've never been that way. Yeah. So I have friends who, you know, have very divergent views to me, not when it comes to bigotry issues, because I, I can't live with that, I'll be honest. Yeah. But, you know, I have friends who think that the earth is flat um or you know that kind of thing or think the moon yeah. landings didn't happen you know uh -huh. so having that conversation it is really eye-opening sometimes to just hear a completely different perspective and obviously it's not one that i share but as long as it's not something that encourages violence or death or kind of destruction or you know bigotry or homophobia or something nasty and cruel i'm willing to have that conversation and a lot of people would treat those people with scorn and derision. And I don't like that. And I try to avoid it if at all possible, because my background is very different and didn't have the same kind of, you know, influences that a lot of my very wealthy, posh kind of like colleagues. It's uh, one of my favorite things when I hear that scorn or division coming out of my guest, I get to do them the favor of saying, oh, come on, you got to lighten up. That can't be true. You cannot think that this is 100% true about these people. There's no way you're that intolerant. And I, I, it's a loaded question. But I'm giving them the chance to back off and go, yeah, you know what? Get caught up sometimes. And I've had people do that. I've had people go the other way and be like, nope, F those people. And I'm like, all right. Well, you know, as long okay. as you <laughs> Ad break. Ad break. <laughs> um, yeah, th and this is great. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Who is the most famous person in your phone? You don't have to answer this question if you don't want to. But who is the most famous person in your phone right now? You'd be like, I'm going to call boop, Graham Norton. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> well, the person I most enjoyed speaking to, but you may not even know who he was, but he was very famous in this country, was our kind of, you know, uh, Sir Philip Green, who okay. ran Topshop. He's like a billionaire. He was caught up in all kinds of, you know, accusations of inappropriate behavior over the years in terms of pensions and in terms of his personal life. But in terms of the person that I most enjoyed getting a phone call from, never knowing on the Russian roulette of the conversation, whether or not it was going to be, you know, a lot of fun or a lot of shouting, 
he was the person I enjoyed uh, speaking with the most. Maybe not the most famous, but I have people in the current administration, obviously, and I would, it would be remiss of me to reveal their names. We just changed right. prime minister. And, you know, I'm, I'm texting and WhatsApping with a couple of people who, <laughs> who are inside that world now. So it's just so interesting because you know this too, is one day somebody is, you know, somebody who is a friend of yours doing nothing. And the next minute, they're a cabinet minister. Yeah. And that's that's what's so interesting about genuinely, we talked about this earlier, having connections that aren't fake, is that I like you just as much when you're in the gutter and, you know, you couldn't pay your yeah. bills. And when you're helping run the country, it makes no difference to me. I treated you the same all the way through. And that's rare. Yeah, right. And I'm going to give you a chance to, to talk. And if you want to, great. And if not, no pressure from me. I have people back all the time. And they're, you, a lot of my friends are people that I've met because of my show. And I'm like, oh, my God, I know this person because of the show. And I just adore them. And I talk to them all the time. And yeah, so you have these opportunities to build really incredible relationships. And, and I have this lovely platform where I get to share these experiences with people like you and movie makers and athletes and historians, all kinds. It's just an, an incredible thing. Yeah, that's the, that's the privilege of it, right, is that you just never stop learning. I feel that these experiences, these conversations, I'm not a great reader, ironically, although for my education, I had to read a lot of books, you know, learning to be a lawyer and studying literature. But the thing I love is, is the book of conversation, to sit down with somebody in a coffee shop who nobody's ever heard of and learn about their life or some great minister or leader of a country and have a little chat with them before the interview starts or measure their handshake. Is it limp? Is it firm? You know, that was what my dad always measured everybody by. Those little moments are just kind of, you know, they stay with you all through life and, and they make you more interested. Oh, your battery got exhausted, Pete. What happened? <laughs> Yeah, I didn't realize that was going to happen. All Did right. I exhaust your battery? Was that personal? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, personal. Um, and, now, and now my picture is not so uh, rich and colorful like I like normally. Um, yeah, and I, we get a chance to talk about this, but you've booked Clintons, and I booked Roger Clinton. And and uh, I love Roger. He's an incredible dude. He cries every time we talk. He's just this loving soul. And uh, you know what I get to do on my show is I get to focus on Roger instead of his, his sister-in-law or, or his big brother you know because rogers this amazing story of failure and failure and all of a sudden your 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 life is stolen from you and you're, you're on this rocket ship that your brother built and you're you know because you don't get asked to be first brother you just get taken of on the course. ride you're stuck with that ride huh yeah or frank stallone he's like man i have my own career sylvester was carrying my gear you know and all of a sudden he <laughs> pitched on a ride with his brother's rocket and Oh, these stories are just amazing, and, and I just, I really appreciate you coming on the show. What are your final thoughts? We'll wrap it up, and then and then we'll uh, chat after. Yeah, of course. I mean, my final thoughts are that I hope I've done something that you love, which is like in my book, if you get around to reading it, there's a lot of American people in it as well. Sean Spicer, Stormy Daniels, James Comey. We had all those interviews. Is I hope you feel like you're sitting next to me, Pete. You know, you're my buddy, and we're having a chat about it. And my book is conversational it's not pretentious it's wants to take you on that billionaire experience so i hope i hope some people enjoy it out there it's you know lucky me that i'm getting it published in the states that's uh, quite rare for a first time author so i feel very lucky yeah it's fantastic everybody get that book it's called scoops it's on amazon one ellen McAllister, or just use the link right there that will help you all right stand by for one second Hey, thanks for watching the show. I really appreciate it. Right here, you can subscribe. Please do that. It makes the show grow. Hit that notification bell so you know which incredible guest is coming up next. Down below is the PayPal link. You can put a small subscription in. That is an enormous help. All that money goes right back into the show. And then right up over here are the next episodes you should listen to, curated by yours truly. Thank you so much for watching the